heaven and for divine illumination upon the word. If you have your Bibles, I want us to turn to Philippians, the third chapter. And I want this morning to speak to you on how to have spiritual victory. I think that ought to interest us all. And uh, it may surprise you to know that the greatest obstacle to spiritual victory is self-trust. I trust we get all of that. I want to begin reading here in Philippians, the third chapter, starting with the third verse. Paul in writing says, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit, in the spirit and rejoiced in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, or trust himself. Let me put that in, that's not doing violence. If any man trust himself, if that would get us through trusting yourself, then he said, look at my uh, credentials. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, or in himself, he said, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. I want you to notice that. He said, you couldn't put a finger on my life anywhere. I'm that good. But he said, I don't, can't trust that. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. I'll stop there. In 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul said, I am chief of sinners. And then in Romans, the seventh, the seventh chapter, and several verses there. So let's see, the 18th verse. Paul said, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh. This is without Christ, well, dwelleth no good thing. That is, without Christ, there isn't a good thing in me. Come on now. He said, without Christ, there isn't a good thing in me. Paul, uh, this man who didn't trust himself, uh, he said, I am what I am by the grace of God. Self-trust is the greatest obstacle to spiritual victory. Before man, Paul was as bold as a lion, but before God, he didn't have anything good to say about himself. He never came to God and reminded God of how good he was. He never reminded God of anything good he had done because there was no goodness in him. Well, I hope we get all this. As far as a man trusts himself, he distrusts God. And vice versa. Now, self-trust, of course, uh, comes in these areas, self-assurance, education, birth, social standing, financial status, all the things 
that we put a prize or premium on, Paul said he had those, but he counted them as dung that he might win Christ. In 1 Corinthians 10 chapter, he says, Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Charles Wesley said that every good thought, even every good thought he had came from God. He couldn't even think a good thought. I want you to see that a man who trusts himself is far from victory. The better we are, the greater the chance of self-trust. If you think you're good and there's goodness in you, then I want you to know that that's the, the, the greater the chance of self-trust. One of the marks of self-trust is to feel that you're advanced spiritually more than somebody else. Brother, I could stop really right there, I think. This is one of the marks of self-trust, is that you feel like you're advanced spiritually better than somebody else. That's a mark of self-trust. We are a little or much advanced above others. This is where our church is a little more spiritual. That's a mark of self-trust. Anybody? <laughs> May God have mercy on us. How easy it is to feel like that we are a little more spiritual than somebody else, that they're not quite as spiritual. We were farther advanced. We're farther along the line. We're more advanced. We're not advanced anywhere. There is no good in us. Now, I'm trying to help us to see something here. That's the same thing as the two men who went up to the temple to pray. The one man said, I'm not as other men. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I possess. I'll keep it. He kept the law, all of these things. And Jesus said he didn't get anything. How good are you? If you think you're good, you won't get anything. I'm trying to help us to see that Paul is driving at something here, that self-trust is the, one of the greatest obstacles to spiritual victory. If you've got confidence in yourself, you are on a dangerous road. How easy it is to have confidence in yourself. Another mark of self-trust is to think that you wouldn't commit certain sins. That's a mark of self-trust. You see somebody else doing sin and think, Brother, I would never do that. That's a mark of self-trust. You're trusting that you wouldn't do that. You've got confidence in yourself. And any man who has confidence in himself that he wouldn't commit a certain sin, he's very much in danger of committing it because there's no good in him and he himself cannot keep from it unless God keeps him from us, and then it's by the grace of God that you don't do it. So if you think you wouldn't commit a certain crime, uh, it's a mark of self-trust. Now that you are saved and sanctified and filled with the Spirit, we can trust ourselves. So oh, that's a trick of the devil. I'm saved, I'm sanctified, I'm filled with the Spirit. I want you to know now that I wouldn't do any of these sins. I wouldn't commit any other. That's a mark of self-trust. And you're right in line for doing it. It is only by God's grace that we won't commit any sin. I don't care what the sin is. It's only by God's grace that you won't commit it or you would commit it or could commit it if God permitted you to do it. You say, well, I wouldn't do that sin. It makes me think of one of the stories in the Old Testament. I can't remember exactly where it is right now. One of the kings that uh, I think it was with Abraham, one of the kings, he told God, he said, now I didn't sin there. And God said, it's because I didn't let you sin. If you don't commit certain sins because God doesn't let you sin, 
You say, well, some people commit sins. There, there's a reason for that too. God may, he, God's got his own reasons. He may be to teach the lesson or he may be to destroy self-confidence. There's a lot of reasons for that. So it's only by God's grace that we wouldn't commit certain sins. We need to come to the throne of grace for it. All of the good thoughts we have about ourselves take away our trust in God. If you think you're a pretty good sort of a person, that's destroying your trust in God. If you know there's no good in you, you've got to trust God. You're on, you're on a strong foundation. Wonderful thoughts about ourselves take away from the glory that belongs to God. If I think there's a goodness in me and I'm pretty good sort of a fella, I'm taking away from the glory that belongs to God. If you see good in me, I can give God the praise for it. It's because of Jesus. You notice how much the Bible says in Christ, by Christ, through Christ, everything is through Christ or in him and God's trying to get us there in Christ. Outside of that, then there's not a good thing in anybody in this building. And you're all capable of committing any sin under the category of sins. If you take it outside of Christ, then I can't trust any man in this building. There's no good in us. But with Christ, we can trust him. This is like the example of the moon that shines upon the earth and the wonderful, the, uh, the, the moon can give such beautiful light. And yet if the moon could talk, it could be proud of itself. But he said, the moon, you don't have anything in you. All you're doing is reflecting light from the sun. And that's all we can do is reflect the light of Jesus, the light of the glory of God. God's glory, we reflect it. There's none in us. It doesn't come out of us. It comes out of Christ in us. That's the good that there is in us. So Paul knew that all the good in him was from God. Whatever we think is our strength. Wherever you think you're strong, that's your weakness. I'm pausing there a minute. I want you to get that. Whatever you think is your strength is your weakness because you don't have any strength. If you think you're strong in some areas, you're weak because you don't have strength. The only strength you have is in Christ and it's not our own. I think of the story there in 2 Kings, the 8th chapter. You remember where the king of Syria was sick and uh, he sent his servant Hazel down to Elisha and he said, go down and find out if I can live, I'm going to live or not. And the servant went down to Elisha. Hazel went down and said, my master is sent to ask him, will inquire, will he live or not? And Elisha looked at him and he said, yes, you can go back and tell your, your master that uh, he will recover from this illness, but he's still going to die. And then he looked at him, Hazel, and said, hey, Hazel, in essence, the story is, you're going to be the one that's going to kill him. He's going to get well, but you're going to kill him. And he told all the things that he would do. And Hazel said, am I a dog that I would do these things? He couldn't believe he would do it. But he went home and did the very things that Elisha said that he would do. And I think one of the classic examples in the Word of God is Peter. When Peter said to the Lord, I will never leave thee. Now these are the fellows, they're weak, they might, but I won't. That's human nature. That's not Peter. That's me. That's you. When the Jesus left them and the Holy Spirit wasn't with them yet, Peter had no strength, he had no good in himself. He denied the very Lord that he'd been with for three years. That's you and me. He said, these other fellows, these other poor fellows, now I know they're not so good. Yeah, can you see self-trust? He wouldn't do it. We can look at other people and think that's awful, the sin they're committing. Brother, but except for the grace of God, we do the very same thing. And we can only thank God we don't thank you, Jesus, for your marvelous, wonderful grace that's kept me. 
I give you the praise, the glory. I can't claim any goodness of my own or anything. I can't claim any glory at all whatsoever. I can only say thank you for your grace, Jesus. It's been your grace that's kept me through these years. So someone, can, someone said you can know you're bad. And something means that you can know you're bad but still be as proud as a peacock that you're as good as you are. Oh, I know I'm bad. I know that. I know that in me there's no good thing and still be just as proud as a peacock that I'm as good as I am. Come on now, is that the truth? Am I speaking the truth or am I just talking? Look at Job. I want to turn back and look at the book of Job. The Bible says he was a righteous man. I don't know how anybody could be any more righteous than Job was. God said he was righteous. But I want you to know Job was a proud man. Look at here in the 29th chapter, if you have your Bibles, we could look at some of that together. The 29th chapter of Job, starting with the second verse. Job here has been a foot... Uh, afflicted with boils and all the things that were taken away from him. Here he's on the ash heap. And uh, this is what he says. Oh, that I were as months past as in the days when God preserved me, when his candle shined upon my head, and when by his light I walked through the darkness, as I was in the days of my youth when the secret of God was upon my tabernacle, when the Almighty was yet with me and my children were about me, when I washed my steps with butter, and the rock poured me out rivers of oil. When I went out of the gate through the city, when I prepared my seat in the street, that is when he sat there, he said, the young men saw me and hid themselves. The aged men arose and stood up. He said, oh, that I were back in those days when that happened. The princes refrained from talking and laid their hands upon my mouth. That's what happened. And oh, I would to God I could be back there again in those days. The nobles held their peace. Their tongue cleaved to the roof of their mouth. When the air heard me, then it blessed me. When the eyes saw me, it gave witness to me. Because I delivered the poor that cried, and the fatherless, and him that had none to help, to help him. The blessing of him that was ready to perish came upon me. I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. I put on righteousness, and it clothed me. My judgment was as a robe and a diadem. I was eyes to the blind. I was feet to the lame. Oh, it was back in those days when I had all of this and, and uh, people looked and respected me. He said, I was father to the poor and the cause which I knew not I searched out. And I break the jaws of the wicked and pluck the spoils out of their teeth. And then I said, I shall die in my death and shall multiply my days as the same. Well, he said, let's see, what else? The 21st verse, unto me men gave ear and waited and kept silence at my counsel. After my words they spake not again and my speech dropped them. And they waited for me as for rain and they opened their mouth wide as for the latter rain. This is, this is, this is the righteous man. Oh, he said, I, as I wish it were back in the days when men looked and respected me and kept silence if I spoke. And this is what he's longing for. He was a proud man. And later on, when God reveals himself to him, he said, oh, I should have kept my hand over my mouth. I've been speaking when I should have been quiet. And Job said, oh, he said, and then finally he said, I've heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore, he said, I abhor myself, I'm vile. Oh, that's when God showed him what it was like. Before God showed him what he was like, he said, oh, that I wish of war that men would be quiet when I spoke. This is what he longed for down in his heart. This is self-trust. But when God showed him what was in his heart, he said, oh, I'm vile. I abhor myself. I repent in dust and in ashes. That's when God revealed to him what he really was, a revelation from God that there was no good in him, but all the good was Christ. What a marvelous privilege it is to come to Jesus Christ and ask him to take over in our lives. If Christ could take over in all of our hearts and lives, it would be Christ shining out through all of us. 
What a wonderful homes we would have, what wonderful churches we would have, what wonderful lives we would have. But I like what Brother Lawrence and others have quoted it, and I've quoted it before. This is their brother who worked in the monastery, and he, he gave Jesus the credit for all good when he sinned. He just came back to Jesus and told him, said, Lord, I sinned there, and I'm sorry, please forgive me. He go up and wouldn't worry about it anymore. He said, Lord, if you don't help me, I'll do it again. Why, he knew there was no good in him. He knew that he couldn't keep from sinning. He knew that. And he said, God, if you don't help me, I'll do it again. So he said, Lord, forgive me to get up and on his way. If God didn't help me, he wouldn't worry. He didn't worry about it. So the greatest hindrance to spiritual growth is trust in ourselves. Paul knew that whatever good was done, that it was God working in him, God working through him, Jesus living his life out through him. Jesus wants to live his life out through us. That's the goodness that the world's longing to see. That's what it is that the world is waiting for, Christ in us, not for us just to be good people. Paul said he didn't count, he counted that all as done. What a wonderful privilege to come to Jesus and trust him, ask him to come into our hearts and lives and take over in us, and then all the good that we see in us or that anybody sees in us, we can give God the praise for it. It's all because of Jesus. What a wonderful privilege to serve Christ and to have him as our Lord and Savior.